Hello, everybody. Wow, look at you. The aura of wisdom is ever more bright and blinding coming from you. Welcome back to another edition of Kopi Chats with me, Weilin, where we talk about news from our part of the world right here in Southeast Asia, specifically for me in Singapore, but we always talk about stuff that goes on around the world anyway. If you're new here, check out the show notes. Uh, you'll see the topics that are listed and you can skip ahead to whatever interests you, skip the parts that don't interest you. Otherwise, sit back, relax as we embark on you know uh, another journey with the rest of us regulars to go through all the interesting stuff fit to talk about on the internet. First up, the Quad dances around India's reliance on Russia. Now, if you had no idea about what's going on in the world, that would be a very strange headline. You would think that there's some kind of dance, new dance called the quad dance. And quad dances, you know, there's a quad dance going around India. And uh, specifically India's reliance on Russia, that makes no sense. Uh, but in this ca instance, it is very clear. Um, the quad is a grouping of countries, including Japan, India, the United States, um, and others. And uh, they are banding together allegedly, supposedly, to counter the influence of China. So, what does the Asia Times, this is the Asia Times, what do they have to say? Well, they say that uh, India's carefully calibrated stance on Russia-Ukraine has evoked global disparagement. Wow, that's harsh. So India has seen from voting against Russia at the UN. Yes, that's true. Um... Speaking to Indian Parliament, Foreign Minister S. Jai Shankar stopped short of using the word war. And mean, meanwhile, India has bought substantial amounts of crude oil from Russia despite the rising global clamor to boycott Russian oil and gas. So, I see no problem with this though. Right? Look at this over here. Over the weekend, the United States made it clear it would not reprimand India for its abstention at the United Nations or for purchasing Russian oil. Wow. Who does that? How, how is this acceptable? It is extremely insulting. Who gives you know any one country the right to reprimand another as though they were a child? Right? Um... U.S. President Joe Biden called India's position somewhat shaky. Uh, what's shaky about it? Unspecified. Unspecified. But it is, you know, a little bit... Uh, he's trying to... Joe Biden was still rather, you know, he's uh, rather being rather tactful there and saying, oh, it's somewhat shaky without being really specific about it. Hmm. Um, and then... Yeah, the U.S. Re refrain from overreacting, which is just about right, because uh, what would you say to a sovereign country, uh, one of the biggest countries in the world? You wouldn't reprimand them. So, also, U.S. Undersecretary for Political Affairs, Victoria Nuland. Now, if you check out one of my earlier episodes, um, if you just, I think if you search on YouTube, Victoria Nuland, while visiting my channel, uh, it'll throw up the correct episode where I tell you how she has confessed to not only arranging the uh, 2014 uh, being part of the uh, political mm, chaos of the Ukraine in 2014, but also testifying to the U.S. Congress that there are bio facilities uh, in the Ukraine that the Americans are somehow involved in. She told Indian television channel that Washington Washington understood India's needs and was willing to provide alternative sources for arms in Soviet era spare parts, because that apparently is one of the reasons why India is still close to Russia because it is their interest. They bought a lot of weapons from Russia and or before that the Soviet Union, and those weapons require a lot of spare parts, a lot of maintenance, and the only people who know how to do any of that are the Russians. So. While India's allies in the Quad would not are not very happy, uh, it seems that they are they understand somewhat, and but it cannot cannot avoid using this disparaging language that 
uh, hints that they see India as the junior partner here. It's so insulting. So in, if you have a longer memory, you'll remember that um, since the uh, U.S.-led war on terror began, um, a lot of U.S. aid money has gone to India's uh, rival Pakistan because Pakistan's help was needed to catch Osama bin Laden. Uh, many military operations were staged from Pakistan going into Afghanistan. So a lot of money was given to Pakistan, uh, much to the displeasure of India. But back then, the US didn't care. Uh, also, the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan visited Moscow a few weeks ago. So it shows the India's uh, difficult position. On the one hand, uh, they have had, you know, just coming out of an era, because Osama bin Laden is dead, right? So uh, in political terms, they're coming out of an era where the U.S. was aligned with Pakistan for uh, anti-terrorism reasons. Uh, and now it seems that the Pakistani prime minister went to visit Russia to forge closer ties, which puts India in a difficult spot as well, because while well, they rely on Russia, but uh, it seems that Russia is getting closer to Pakistan, which again would make them really nervous, right? Uh, will they get too close and therefore threaten the supply of uh, military equipment to India? That is definitely a concern. So India should be, you know, in this situation, they should be jumping at the opportunity to build closer ties to the U.S. Is that not true? Tell me if, I'm, if you think I'm wrong in the comments. I promise I will read it. Yet, we observe that ah, the, the current U.S. administration is totally incapable of getting India on their side. They've been unable to promise India, they was unable to promise India, you know, sufficient military support for India to feel comfortable moving away from the reliance on Russia. And India has even bought uh, some oil since this piece of news was reported. Yeah. So instead, what what does the U.S. do? Joe Biden issues a soft soft insult to India, and the Under Secretary of State here for Political Affairs, Victoria Nuland, talks about provi providing arms, but provides no proposals, no timetables, no formal announcement at all. You have to ask: Are they even serious? Right. Serious question. In the meantime, though, the Chinese Foreign Minister, uh, this was updated two days ago. Made a uh, makes a has made a surprise for visit to India after a border clash two years ago. So check this out. Uh, China is doing doing great right now. Uh, their their newspaper reports that China and U.S. Inc. largest uh, liquid liquefied natural gas contract in clear progress for you know trade. And now. Since China has gotten a, a great partner, new best friend in Russia, who can sell them huge amounts of natural gas, China can just sell that American natural gas to Europe at a hefty profit. Wow, isn't geopolitics great? So China's just winning all the way now. They uh, have decided to bury the hatchet with China. They're making tons of money on natural gas and countries like the U.S. is still struggling, just trying not to trip over themselves to bring India on board to their side. It's the state of the world, guys. You got to really take note of this, uh, how incompetent seeming, you know, our free alleged, you know, supposed free world leaders are. Okay, enough about, you know, insulting uh, a man in decline, Joe Biden. Moving on. A few episodes ago, I spoke about Facebook allowing war posts, you know, urging, um, urging violence against Russian invaders. Now, you look at this, you might think, oh, well, it's against Russian invaders, right? What's wrong with that? No, 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 no. This goes so far as to allow calls of violence against Russians. So just for being Russian, someone could call for your death. It's outrageous. That put, reminds me of this uh, 
reminds me of what happened um, about a maybe a year ago when uh, a certain orange colored man was kicked off social media for his tweets that were very mean and allegedly would insult inside violence. He was kicked off social media, but now Facebook's coming all out to say, oh, well, if you call for violence against the people I don't like, it's okay. It doesn't matter if they're totally innocent and have never you know, done anything bad. They just happen to have the wrong passport. So what do you get? Well, now you get uh, posts on Instagram that look like this. Or is it Facebook? I don't even know. It doesn't even matter. It, I don't even use these anymore. Look at this. This is absolutely you know, despicable, really despicable. So to my knowledge, no other social media company has announced similar policy changes. It's just Facebook. So my advice, everyone, stay away from Facebook. It is, it is actual, uh, actually damaging, damaging our brains. So with that excellent advice, if I say so myself, uh, let's talk about something a little, a little more happy looky here now on this channel i've spoken before about indonesia taking steps towards uh incorporating nuclear energy into their you know their energy mix and now singapore is going that way as well singapore explores tapping nuclear energy by 2050 isn't that interesting uh let's see it says somewhere here that they project the nuclear would supply 10% of the uh, energy needs of Singapore. Let's see if I can find it. 10%? No. Mm, percent? No. 10%? Oh, yeah, here you go. 10% of the country's needs. Yes, that's right there. So... How did, how did we come to this? Check this out. In 2012, a government study, feasibility study, concluded that uh, there were, the technologies available were not fit for deployment in Singapore, but technology has improved since then, pointing to newer nuclear plants designed and tested in major countries that have the potential to be much safer than the plants in operation today. And that's true. And I think that this is the start of uh, what we expect to be non-stop drum beats of pro-nuclear propaganda uh, but it's true now how do i know it's true because i've been following this topic for some time actually uh, let's see what have i got in my notes now if you're interested um you can look up small modular reactors so how do we know that uh there are what do we know about small modular rea uh, nuclear reactors? They're in use on aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, you know, uh, large, a lot of large military vessels. And they are extremely safe. When was the last time you heard of a uh, military vessel, you know, a large one, aircraft carrier, a nuclear sub that had an accident because of its nuclear reactor? The answer is never, never. Now, on the one hand, if it happened, you know, the governments might conceal that. Specifically, they, I think in this case, might be the U.S. Navy uh, or any other country. It could be the U.K., China. Mm. But isn't it notable that, you know, of all the ships out there, there's not even a hint of a whiff of a uh, hint of a whiff of a, you know, I think that's enough of problems with uh, nuclear power, uh, from small modular reactors. That's amazing, isn't it? That is quite remarkable. And we all know, have you ever thought about how many nuclear power uh, plants there are in the world? I mean, we know, all of us know about the ones with the accidents. So in the US, there was Three Mile Island. Uh, in Russia, there was Chernobyl. And in Japan was the uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant. So, those are three, and how many there are there in the whole world? Was it a hundred? You know, meaning that three percent of them actually had uh, problems. No, not even close. Let's see, four hundred forty, four hundred forty. So we've had three out of a hundred would be three percent. Uh, 
divide by 4, it's like 0.75%, right? Uh, it's And that those with the problems were the, as I understand it, if I'm not mistaken, those are the first generation nuclear power plant designs. Whereas today, we are at the fourth generation, Gen 4. So if you, if you went uh, into Google and you search Gen 4 nuclear, or you went into YouTube and search Gen 4 nuclear, you get a really good education. It's really interesting, um, the designs that they have and how some of them uh, are designed to be, they are impossible to melt down because there are some designs that require you to provide power to the nuclear uh, reaction for it to continue. So in the past, designs, uh, once you get the reaction going, it powers itself. But that is now no longer the design because the reaction can run out of control, right? You can't turn it off. You have to do very complex things to shut down the reaction. The reaction is self-powering. But now the designs would be something like you have to constantly provide power from, let's say, the local electricity grid such that uh, it will enable the reaction to continue. If it stopped, there will be something like maybe the, you know, the uh, material would not get in or you know, some, uh, some other thing would not be able to continue. So it's like meltdown proof. Um, so that's what I've read. Also, Gen 4 Nuclear apparently uses the nuclear fuel um, that's left over from elsewhere. So in the past, one of the drawbacks of using nuclear power was that it would generate some amount of nuclear waste, which you have to store. Now, Gen 4 Nuclear is so efficient, uh, it's actually designed to eat up this old fuel to generate more power. Wow, that's remarkable, isn't it? And none of this is in the article that I just showed you because it's, you know, it's just very light on... Um, there's too much to be said, and it's not really here. But if you looked into it, you would find it, and that's really interesting. And oh yeah, I want to mention that these 440 nuclear power plants. Um, I read some articles on it. I think uh, maybe the one right here at the top. The it says that together they produce about 10 percent of the world's energy. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so on a grand scheme of things, 440 nuclear power plants is not that much. But there's, they produce so much power because nuclear energy is so powerful that it can account for 10% of the world's actual power uh, with no air pollution. Yeah. So truly, this would be a great boost uh, to Singapore when it arrives. There sounds like, it sounds like there's, there's a good chance it would happen um, if the safe, safer designs, uh, Singapore's neighbors, may not be as nervous you know they would probably have to do some work to uh convince their neighbors you know that there's no danger please don't invade me you know things like that totally normal but sounds like uh, it'll be a step in the right direction right with uh green aspirations you know reduce uh, pollution everything that'll certainly help but i, th I reckon that it would it could also bring down power prices okay speaking of nuclear Speaking of dangerous things that can explode in your face. Just today, the, oh, just yesterday, sorry. The Singapore government put up a white paper to tackle wide-ranging issues on women's development. <gasps> Dare I talk about it? I think I will. Bear with me now. Let's hope that none of us get cancelled for this, you know. Uh this uh, outrageous thing we're about to do, which is to discuss women's issues. Okay, proceed with care. Um, so there is a white paper, which is a fancy way to say a paper to state, you know, what kind of policy, uh, we want, what is our, what would you think about it in policy terms? White paper lays out recommendations, support women's aspirations and address challenges they face. Sounds good. Uh, Recommendations span five areas, including creating equal opportunities for women in the workplace and supporting caregivers. Uh, the communications minister says that this raises awareness that women still need support in many ways. Hmm. Okay, okay, fair enough. I mean, I'm sure that uh, 
even men agree that we want to have you know a fairer more inclusive society we do we do um among other things one of the controversial points was the legalization of elective egg freezing for women age 21 35 so uh this is for women they can freeze their eggs so that they can have viable eggs for having children later in life right uh reducing financial strain on caregivers by enhancing a home care giving grant and normalizing flexible workspace arrangements yeah that's something great i would be in fav totally in favor of that too so let's see what are some of these things that um are being discussed ah following are the collective action plans for each year it doesn't mean that these policies are in place it's just uh, a white paper is just stating that this is the policy you know positions that we want to take and we'll come up with the details later on so we want to have a uh, new workplace fairness legislation okay sounds all right entrench flexible work uh, arrangements as a norm sounds good you know can't, can't argue with that develop career mentorship networking opportunities and training programs for women at work and re-entering the workforce okay i understand that for women re-entering the workforce but uh why specifically you know mentorship and networking and training for women at work what about men right do men uh not need mentorship networking and training why specifically for women i feel like there's a stuff that's a little iffy there okay moving on though um encourage greater use of parental leave entitlements is that for women only like i can see that men could also benefit from this right um you do want your men to be involved in the raising of the children maybe this this uh, goes both ways i wouldn't know wouldn't really know increase women's representation on boards with effort led by the council for board diversity um company boards mm, interesting interesting that that this sounds like something that could go uh very well or very badly because do you, singapore has always been traditionally you know um meritocratic that's a strong like tradition in singapore so it seems like you need to take into account not just merit but gender revised guidelines the singapore exchange listing rules support gender diversity hmm so what does this mean in order to be a listed company you'd have to fulfill some kind of gender diversity quotas is that what it means because it sounds like it and so this is where i think you know some of these are a little uh a little concerning because what does it mean do you need to have certain number of women employees certain number of women you know ceo cmo cto coo it's like c-level executive need to be certain number of women um what if you can't find them right what if your uh industry is just not popular among women hmm can see some potential problems right recognition and support for caregivers ease caregivers load very generic what does that mean do you give them money do you you know give them free uh, services such as free child care at certain times what does that mean it feels like it needs more clarification reduce caregivers financial strain okay so maybe that e either you make things cheaper for them or you give them money that's what it means can't argue with that enhance support for women and children oh wait a minute are we assuming that caregivers are all women here that doesn't seem like a that seems like a little discriminatory you know what i mean a little discriminatory ramp up awareness caregiver initiatives and community support very generic don't really understand enhance support for caregivers of persons with disabilities and children with uh developmental needs uh yeah sounds good and uh i reckon that is this specific to women because we're talking about women's development right but this seems like an issue that would be for, for both right protection against violence and harm revised sentencing framework for sexual and hurt offenses so i'm in favor of uh being tough on uh sexual crime i uh, kind of wouldn't argue with that enhance protection for victim survivors of family violence absolutely totally agree with that raise awareness and accessibility of resources for on victims of online harms also agree uh strengthen support and awareness of resources to address workplace harassment absolutely uh implement a national framework to promote safe sport to prevent forms of abuse and harassment which may occur in the sporting environment 
Hmm. Right. That's a bit fishy, though. So what does that mean? How would uh you promote safe sport? Does this apply to you know casual recreational sports, or is it only for uh professional sports? You know, for instance, if if there's a uh, if people are playing badminton recreationally, uh, what are these guidelines that would promote safe sport? Right. And these guidelines would describe forms of abuse and harassment. Harassment. Will there be any action taken? This seems like a bit iffy, right? Hmm. And then, okay, there, there are the nice things. Enhance support for single parents. Yes, that sounds good. I reckon that goes both ways, right? Not just single women, but also, you know, single male parents, right? Enhance support for divorcing or divorced women. Oh, wait, only women? Huh. I'm sure there are men who uh, fall into a uh, uh, financial, you know, bad situation with divorce as well, but it sounds like they're being excluded. That's not very nice. So, already, this white paper seems like, and I, I, reckon, I guarantee that most men will take note of the headline and skip past the actual news. When they see this, because why would you? Why would it really bother you? Okay, so you're promoting, you know, women's development. That's great, right? It doesn't really concern you. But then when you delve into it, like I just did, oh, it seems like men are being excluded from some things that you might think mm, should actually involve men. That's not the only time, though. Last week, there was this uh, commentary on Channel News Asia. The previous one was on the newspaper Today Online. And this one introduced a brand new uh, phrase that I never heard before, male allyship. So what does it say? What does it say? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Let's dive into this. The role of a male ally. Right. Uh, look, it begins. No one can really say when the term male allyship formally entered our everyday discourse. Yes, no one can say that because it hasn't entered everyday discourse is what I would say. Has it? Has it entered everyday discourse? Very doubtful. Role of a male ally. Hmm. It rightly reported that women who make up roughly half the world's population are disadvantaged across the board. Really? Okay. Okay. You know, I'm willing to to accept that. You know, uh, claim provisionally as we read through the rest of the article. If you just made that claim, you know, just as is, I might have some issue with it. But maybe you have more to say, right? According to data collated by UN, two-thirds of illiterate adults are women, 24% of parliamentary seats are occupied by women, and women earn 23% less than men. So, wow, those sound re really bad. Immediately, those sound like really bad uh, statistics, right? Uh, two-thirds of illiterate adults are women, 24% uh, of parliamentary seats are occupied by women, and women earn 23% less than men. Now, I can't speak to the illiteracy or the parliamentary seats, but... You know, it's really easy to look up this gender pay gap, which is the 23% figure, um, because it's being repeated everywhere. Let me show you. Here, this uh, is the official website of the UN Women Organization. Let's see. Um, I want to check my notes. Yeah, this is frequently highlighted elsewhere, including on this UN Women website. Here you go. Now, what I couldn't find was an author authoritative study on this. There's none. You could try Googling it. I already did. See, the, the Channel News Asia article had a link here to a research paper about institutional male allyship in Australia. But oddly enough, for the, these uh, remarkably impactful, powerful, you know, statistics and big claims, there's no link. There's no resource. It's just a claim. And the same goes here, UN Women. So there are uh, links to different sites, you know. But again, no link to any evidence for this 23% uh, claim. Uh, let me see. What else did I say? Uh, I wonder why, right? So naturally, this is a kind of a big deal. People generally want equal e treatment for all. In fact, the to prove my point, 
the U.S. Department of Labor went so far as to investigate a uh, target Google for investigation due to their suspicions that Google underpaid women. Of course, we all know that when you hear uh, loud, you know, advocacy for um, equal treatment of women, I think you have to be honest, the uh, United States is right up there. There's always a lot of noise coming from there and uh, always uh, a lot of high profile examples, high profile actions being taken, right? Now, what happened? Hilarity, hilarity. Google finds is underpaying many men. Ho 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 Subsequently, there was no more update to the Department of Labor's uh, investigation of Google. No, they just suddenly lost interest. I couldn't find any updates. There were they didn't appear to be any updates. Maybe I'm just terrible at you know doing my research on this. Uh, of course, this uh, does it surprise you? Uh, it shouldn't. The largest companies in the world are also very, very pro-feminism and pro-minorities. And if you look up uh, any large company that you're interested in, you know, from Apple to Amazon to anything, Walmart, uh, you know, even companies like Coca-Cola, they will all have uh, pages on their websites talking about their efforts to, to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's their new buzzword. Everything, you know, even up to Disney um, is very woke. So take a look at my next piece of evidence. There was a Forbes writer um, who wrote, don't buy into gender pay gap myth. Very controversial. This lady, you know, she's uh, very brave, very brave. She quoted from a book here, yeah, saying that uh, the median earnings of the the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics showed that you know median earnings of full time females was seventy seven percent of males. However, it didn't control for the total hours worked. <laughs> yeah, so we might be comparing men working forty hours to women working thirty five. It's possible. Not proven to be true, but uh, it seems that the the very uh, sensible, like very conservative s thing to to think, looking at this would be that maybe it needs a bit more study, right? Maybe it needs a bit more study. Well, I'm totally willing to take you know big action to address a gap, but mm, okay, if we didn't look at the numbers hours work, maybe we should look into that first, right? So it is really interesting. That's not all. I also found a piece on the Foundation for Economic Education, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, to me, it seems like a credible organization um, based in the US. How oh, they have this uh, article about a Harvard study claiming that the gender wage gap is explained entirely by the work choices of men and women. Is that so? Because bear in mind, this gender wage gap at 23% is a huge deal, right? It's right on the UN women's uh, website. Um, it's, it's confidently, you know, and lo loudly proclaimed in this Channel News Asia uh, commentary piece, which I found, you know, it's right there uh, on the homepage, somewhere a little bit further down, around the middle. So it must be a big deal and it must be credibly researched and sourced, right? But this one says no. So what what do we see here? What do you see here? Uh, here's a very interesting Harvard study. Let's see. Here we go. This is the new study out of Harvard. So simply put, uh, the study looked at the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. Um, Workers here were given, yeah, uniform hourly wages where men and women adhered to the same rules and received the same benefits. You know, workers are promoted on seniority rather than performance. So it doesn't matter how you perform. Male and female workers of same seniority have same choices, scheduling, routes, vacation, and overtime. There's almost no scope here for a sexist boss to, to favor men over women. Why? Because 
uh, all the things that you can do in the job are visible, you know, easily visible, right? And it doesn't matter how you perform, it's mostly about your seniority. Now, through further study, uh, let's see, they found that male dr drivers worked about 80% more overtime than their female colleagues and were twice as likely to accept an overtime shift on short notice. And they note that uh, uh, twice as many as women as men never took overtime. So the women uh, were overwhelmingly more likely to avoid overtime. Uh, males also took 48% fewer unpaid hours under the Family, leave, Fed family Medical Leave Act. Uh, women were more likely to take less desirable routes if it meant working fewer nights, weekends, and holidays. The authors concluded that uh, the gap of 89, 89 cents can be explained entirely by the fact that while having the same choice sets in the workplace, women and men make different choices. Right? Now, at this point, I think I find this a very credible study, and uh, of course I'm biased, right? I am a man. Possibly, you know, that might be, uh, I can't eliminate that. Uh, but it seems like uh, this study kind of makes sense. They accounted for, they narrowed, you know, many, many things. They, uh, men and women doing the same jobs, with many factors being controlled for, and uh, overtime is recorded, right? So it's just really good, really good. And they found that the choices made were different, okay? And that seemed to account for all of the difference, right? Okay, really good. Now, if you say that, you look at this and you think, mm, okay, I, I understand if that's, you know, in the Massachusetts Bay Transport Association, you might say, okay, but that's not necessarily the case in Singapore. Yeah, you know, I can kind of understand that. I can kind of understand that. You know, if you're my audience, you may be in Indonesia, Malaysia, and you may think, I don't know if that is exactly the same thing. I understand. But the best I can do for you is give you this study that was uh, done by uh, researchers from the Singapore Ministry of Manpower, as well as the National University of Singapore in 2020, as you can see here. So it's quite recent, quite recent. So these three research researchers wrote a paper on Singapore's gender pay gap. They ad adjusted for uh, factors such as, let's see, age, education, occupation, industry, years of work experience, discrimination, etc. Uh, they didn't actually adjust for discrimination. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this. As this measure. Is at best a broad measure, yeah, it does not offer the most like for like comparison. Okay, you know, fair enough. Uh, actually, the, the down here somewhere, they actually, yeah, here we are. The regression analysis that they do includes the following variables to capture human capital and labor market factors that impact men and women's income separately. So we have age, education, occupation, industry, usual hours worked per week, right? Typical uh, number. So they don't actually have the actual hours worked, okay? Um, so let's see. They found that the, um, the gender pay gap in Singapore, let's see, where is the... Forgive me, I have to look for the right the right chart, right table. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So here, 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 take a look at this. So they say here that when you don't adjust for any of the factors that they're investigating, age, education, you know, uh, all that, all that stuff, uh, years of work experience, um, that sort of thing, then you don't actually, you just see a 16% gap. That's huge, right? Huge gap. Like, wow, men and women really paid huge amount of, uh, really have a huge difference in the amount that they are compensated. But after they factor in all of the factors, this, this is less than half of what they saw, which is just 6%. So their research you know, uh, 
takes that huge 16% figure down to 6%. Now, notice that when, you, when we saw in the Channel News Asia article that there's a 23% gap, did you notice that there's nothing said about, is this adjusted? right for years of experience qualifications different kind of jobs no i don't think it is the best that i could find out and bear in mind i could not find research like actual academic research in this you know as we see here like the kind that we see here in this uh page i couldn't find it and so six percent is the difference now six percent is still a real difference but it's not outrageous like 16 or 23. And even so, all fair-minded people would agree that no, you can't have this, you, don't ju you can't just say, oh, 6%, so therefore it's acceptable. No, it's not acceptable. I wouldn't say that. It is not acceptable. So please don't cancel me. Now, but what I mean to say is, this is a very different figure from 16 or 23%. And also the authors have uh, acknowledged that there are uh, limitations in the in the study, All right? Let's see. The adjusted gender pay gap narrowed, yeah, to six percent in twenty eighteen. This is the unexplained component from the decomposition, right? So after accounting for all the factors that they know about, uh, six percent is the unexplained component. And some of these factors could be, you know, firm type, job scope, position, work experience. So take note, the work experience is not actually factored into this study. Parenthood was not taken into this study. So whether or not you have kids was not taken into account in this study. Do you think that 6%, you know, parenthood and work experience or even the, what was it? The actual numbers of hours worked because as you saw just now briefly, um, the methodology discuss discussion said that uh, usual hours worked per week was what they considered, not the actual hours worked per week. So if everybody works in the, you know, if we're considering company and everybody works in the office, we just assume that everybody worked on the same number of hours because that's usual. So we didn't actually capture the individual's out numbers of hours worked. So... Do you think that number of hours worked can account for a 6% difference in pay? Like if, if I showed you to a man and a woman, they work in the same company doing the same job, and I did not tell you how much, how much time they spent in the office working, and there was a 6% gap in the amount of pay. Hmm. I could imagine that, could you imagine that, you know, the, there's a 6% difference, just 6% difference in their pay and maybe some of that is down to parenthood and number of hours worked. Yeah, yeah. I think those are pretty powerful factors and 6% would be very, very reasonable for that difference. Okay, so where are we now? Um, moving back to the Channel News Asia, Asia article. So you see, right from the beginning, it, within the first few paragraphs already... Uh, we have something very, very controversial here that doesn't seem very credible. Doesn't that kind of ruin it for you? We all want gender equality, right? We want to have men and women have equal opportunities, not be discriminated against. But this statistics, this casts in a doubt everything else. Like, okay, so two-thirds of uh, illiterate adults are women. I haven't checked that out. I don't really know if that's, you know, proven. 20% 4% of parliament seats are occupied by women. Okay, but uh, what does that mean? What does that mean, right? What's the implications? Uh, yes, everybody should be have the chance to ed have an education. And also, um, women should be able to enter public, hold public office just as much as men. But you know, I, that doesn't, that's not enough to convince me that uh, those two at least are not enough to convince me that you know we need to take S uh, urgent remedial action to fix this world. Okay, take a look at this for instance. Here are some here are some gaps in the world that exist. Suicide rates per one hundred thousand in Singapore. And check this out for the most recent uh data we have, men 
predicted 13 suicides per 100,000, and that figure is 7.7 .7 for women, close to half in 2005. In fact, yeah, it seems like it's just about half. So men commit suicide nearly twice the rate of women. Isn't that something we should address as well? Right? Then there's more. Bear with me. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, has this very remarkable chart here. Homicides and other workplace assaults by gender in 2019. So homicides as a percentage of total workplace fatalities by gender shows that uh, men men die you know from uh, of all the you know fatal accidents uh, that kill someone 92.5 of the percent of the 92.5 percent of the victims are men and uh, let's see oh homicides oh sorry all fatal accidents all right all fatal accidents uh, sorry <laughs> took a step back from that um, around 20 percent of all workplace deaths occur occurring to women were due to homicide compared to 7.5 uh, percent of all workplace deaths occurring to men okay uh, that doesn't really tell me what I want to know. Men comprise the majority of workplace homicides. Yes. So the majority of workplace homicides uh, had male victims. 454 workplace homicides, 366 were of men. There we go. Why is this so hard to read? Why is this so hard to read? Okay. So the victims, it would appear that the uh, victims for workplace deaths are overwhelmingly men, right? Yeah. And is that all? No, actually, that's not all. Now back to Singapore. Male teenage suicide hit record high. And when was this? 2019. It's not that long ago. Not that long ago. Very recent. But do you hear about this? No, absolutely not. Apparently, uh, it's just not that big a deal. Nobody advocates for you. Nobody writes uh, com editorial pieces, commentary on the local newspapers talking about um, young, young boys dying at a higher rate than ever before killing themselves and then also uh, here you go check this out the US Federal Bureau of Prisons tells us that 93% uh, of the uh, inmates are male so is this a crisis you know do we have uh, um, too many men going to jail and this needs to be addressed you know so that we have a 50-50 split I don't know because Men are by nature more aggressive, you know. It's it's just how men are. So maybe there's nothing to fix here, right? It's possible. But then how does that equally apply to what you see here? Two thirds of illiterate uh adults are women, or I don't know. Twenty four percent of parliamentary seats are occupied by women. Does that mean, you know, do we know this is because of uh sexual discrimination or is it because uh Maybe fewer women want to hold public office. Very stressful, uh, very stressful thing to do. Very stressful kind of position to occupy, right? So, this really makes it really difficult for me to, uh, to accept. You know what this article wants to tell me because the statistics here mm, are not chosen wisely. Is if I'm being very gentle about it, right? And uh, there are things like, we're, we're told things like, um, 
oh, it is not about women or men. It's about crafting a shared vision of human progress for all. Yet, you know, every um, if we're talking about, you know, we want to f redress gender balances. Well, I just showed you some figures that uh, show men are in trouble, but you won't see it here because, well, this is an article advocating that men help women more. Hmm. I mean, I'm all for helping women. I totally, I do that. I would so totally support that. Uh, but it is very clear that the picture is pretty one-sided, right? I don't even want to show you too much about this uh, article because it's rather pointless to, to me. Um, speaking of conflict, now because I spoke about conflict, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Israel are some of the most gender-neutral countries in the world. Well, because you know, Norway and Sweden are Scandinavian, and they have a f reputation for being that way. Uh, Israel, why, you might ask? Well, I singled them out for praise because it is mandatory for women to serve military service in these countries, giving women I an equal stake in the safety of their country. So if you are in favor of gender equality, don't you have to support equality in these dimensions as well? Isn't that the only way to be truly an ally for equality? Right? So I look forward to uh, meeting allies, um, both male and female, who will support you know, true equality. I would argue that maybe mm, this doesn't go far enough. You know, This article doesn't go far enough. You have to, uh, let's see, have a passion, you know, awareness and passion for gender, gender equity. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. Um, Maybe you have to take it even further, you know. Uh, we have to talk about prison reform, talk about uh, military service reform, have to talk about uh, workplace deaths, you know, reform, um, talking about uh, suicide, you know, uh, mental health. Um, yeah, and then, then and only then do I think that maybe we are going on the right track. Okay, enough about that. Enough about that. I'll leave that. I'll leave you to think about that issue, uh, because, mind you, it's uh, pretty pretty heavy going stuff. Now I've actually come to the end of my prepared material. As usual, uh, just a few topics to get you thinking. Hope you enjoy. You know, the brain massage that I always provide. You know, reliably without fail. Uh, definitely. I would I guarantee that you get your money's worth every time you listen to me. And if you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoy dishing it out, I'm very grateful. Um, I want to, I don't I can only tell you my appreciation. Uh, if you likewise appreciate what I do, hit the like button, uh, subscribe, you know, notification bell, all that good stuff. Mm, and I will be back, you know, as soon as possible with more prepared stuff to talk about. Hope you have a great day, great week even, and uh, we'll add on to the awesomeness that is your life with the next edition of this, you know, when I'm back again, hopefully tomorrow. Till then, take care. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.